there's one fly that perhaps more than any other just flat out gives anglers headaches. They're about as easy to see as a bumblebee in a sunflower field, and you're going to need some tippet that's more like angel hair to get these things tied onto the end of your leader. So why would a fish rise for bugs like this anyways? I mean, are they even a good meal? That's going to be your first thought when you look at them, I bet. Well, to find out what these flies are and why you absolutely need them in your fly box if you want to put some more fish in the net, you're going to want to stay tuned to the rest of today's episode. This is Untangled, fly fishing for everyone. Presented by Ventures Fly Company. Hey everybody, welcome to it. This is Untangled. I am your host, Spencer Durant, coming to you from the wild Wyoming, out here in the middle of nowhere, away from everybody, surrounded by nothing but fish and deer. It's just the way I like it. (laughs) Oh, anyways, I hope you all have had a good week. Hope you've been out on the water. I've had the chance to get out a little bit lately. It's been really good lately. We've had Uh, a bunch of trichos hatching out here on our local rivers, and I love those tiny little mayflies. I know they infuriate some folks, but I have a ton of fun fishing them. They're just just a fun hatch to get into. So anyways, we've got quite a few topics to get to in today's show. We are going to be talking all about how to recognize emergers versus duns, how to match the hatch with streamers, how to fish small flies, what you should know about float tubes, and how to get out and fish with other anglers. Some A little bit of the etiquette of what to do when you're out there with a buddy or, or folks like that. So it's, it's quite a good mix of topics. I'm, I'm excited and happy with how this came out. And uh, once again, I think we are going to keep story time at the end of this episode. So you want to stick around after the questions. So you can go ahead and listen to the stories. And speaking of questions, if you guys have any questions at all about fly fishing that you would like answered on the show, please do not hesitate. Send those on in. There's always a link in the podcast description. That is what keeps the lights on here in the podcast studio. Your questions and, you know, any any kidding aside, uh, th- that's probably my favorite part of doing the podcast is getting to hear from folks and getting to answer your questions and hopefully helping you out on the water. We've, we've had a lot of good feedback lately that the, the, the information that we're sharing here on the podcast is helping you. So, uh, I appreciate that. So if you've got good feedback like that. Uh, I always love to hear it. So never hesitate to share that with me. Oh, well, with that said, we are going to jump right on into the first short question. We've only got one this week. It was a good one. Uh, and then we're going to jump into the main show after that. So our short question, Dylan from Arizona writes in and says, Hello, I am Dylan and I am a 14 years old and live in the desert. What people don't know about Arizona is that we actually have an abundance of trout up north. Me being 14 and not being able to drive, I don't get that many times to go up north to fly fish. So when I do go up north to catch trout, I want to make the most of those opportunities. I was fishing a lake for for trout from shore, and I wondered to myself if getting a float tube or an inflatable boat is something that I should save for. Are float tubes really helpful when fly fishing? I've heard mixed reviews on float tubes, and I was just wondering what your opinion was. Thanks so much. Well, Dylan, thank you a ton for listening. First off, I, I'm stoked that you're getting into the sport uh, at such a young age. Now, hat tip to your parents for uh, supporting that as well. That is just awesome. This is a wonderful thing to have in your life. You're not going to regret it. And as far as you know, not being able to drive because you're 14, you just can't get caught. You can drive all you want. You just can't get caught, right? And obviously, that's a joke. Untangled would never sanction law breaking or anything. It's sad that I have to say that these days, but it's 2023. Who knows, right? <laughs> Anyways, let me answer your question for you here, Dylan. Uh, float tubes, they are actually really good for mountain lakes. They make a huge difference because you are able to get out away from the shore and you have a lot of room for a back cast at that point, uh, especially if there's if the lake's like super shallow around the edges and there's a big drop off 
a lot of the times a fish will hang right on that drop off and it's so far out that you can't really make that cast. So float tubes really do open up a lot more real estate for you on the water. That's that's their main thing is they they enable you to hit the whole lake, not just the edges. And there are quite a few fish around the edges usually in these high mountain lakes, but not all of them. So from that perspective, I think they're 100% worth it. Uh, I think the mixed reviews come from the comfort or lack thereof with float tubes. Uh, they are a lot of extra work as well. You've got to pump them up, uh, especially when you compare them to a canoe or a kayak. But float tubes can also be hauled into places where you are not going to get a canoe or kayak. So they have their they they have their use. I haven't float tubed in a while just because. I, I just have it. I kind of got out of lake fishing a little bit, but I, I noticed this summer I was missing it and I want to get out in the tube, hopefully once or twice before, uh, before the snow flies and everything ices up here in Wyoming. But hopefully that answers your question, Dylan. Thanks a bunch, uh, again, for writing on into the, sh- for writing into us. And with that folks, we are just going to jump right into the main part of today's show. Our first question this week comes to us, Al from California, writes in and says, if the correct process to select a fly is to match the hatch in size, pattern, and perhaps color, why would I ever throw a wooly bugger? Al, that is a fantastic question. Really, really interesting way to look at it. I love the way that you phrase that. It is, it's just a wonderful question. (laughs) I really, really enjoy how you brought that up. Uh, That method that you mentioned for matching the hatch, matching size, then color, or size, pardon me, then shape, then color, that's the best way to pick the right fly for just about any fishing situation. If you are seeing fish rising or you are completely stumped as to what they're eating below the surface, we know they're snacking on nymphs a lot because most of their diet is below the surface. You quote unquote, match the hatched bugs that are either actively hatching or bugs that you find crawling around under rocks in the river that tells you, oh, these are more than likely the same bugs that are drifting in the current. We actually, just as an aside, we actually have an ebook on this entire topic. It's free. Uh, It's on the entire process of matching the hatch. I'll link that in podcast description for anybody that wants it. Again, it's free and it is a super in-depth look at how to pick the right fly for just about any situation. So with that said, what woolly buggers and other streamers imitate, because a woolly bugger is just your, I don't want to say generic, but it, it, it's your basic streamer pattern. It, 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 is, it is about as basic as streamers get. It's a little bit of marabou and some hackle and some chenille, usually. But what these imitate, what woolly buggers and all of your other streamers they are imitating food sources that you often won't find by turning over the rocks or looking at the bugs the fish are actively eating off of the surface. Streamers are imitating leeches. There are other small trout, bait fish, crayfish. We call them crawdads up here, but I know that the, the many freshwater lobsters have about a bajillion different names that nobody can decide what it is. I call it a crawdad, and I think we grew up calling them crawdads uh, in my neck of the woods. Uh, but all, all of those other smaller critters, that is what a streamer is supposed to imitate. Often fish will eat streamers. It's more out of a predatory response than them actually being hungry for that particular bug or there being an actual like quote unquote hatch. Um, so, so that that's your use case there for uh, for for your streamers. Now, since since streamers are so much bigger than most of the nymphs that you're going to run into, you automatically are going to weed out a lot of the smaller fish from being able to fit the streamers into their mouths. So you are not going to catch those fish as often. Streamers are used most often to try and target bigger fish. The idea behind those, behind that being that the bigger fish are going to eat the bigger flies more often. And Alex was telling me he took a guide trip a couple of weeks ago, uh, well, about a month ago now, where 
the guide told him something to the effect of, if we wanted to just catch a single big fish today, we'd be fishing streamers. But if we want to put a lot of good fish in the net, we'll use nymphs. And that really sums up the difference and and the why behind this is the streamer that you're using or 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 this is why you're using a streamer in this instance. You're trying to imitate that bigger food source that bigger fish are more likely to eat. And I do want to reiterate, we talked about streamer fishing, I think a couple episodes ago. I, I can't remember. I think it was a couple episodes ago. Um, the streamers are a ton of fun to fish. I love fishing them. Uh, a lot of anglers I know opt to fish streamers just for the enjoyment factor of it. Uh, I love doing it from a drift boat, especially in clear water when I can watch the trout just come out and smack the fly. It is a ton of fun. It, it's it's hard to beat a really good day on streamers. So just to recap everything that we covered here, you're going to use streamers to imitate larger food sources in an attempt to usually find a larger fish. That's also another way to catch fish that you might enjoy more than nymphing or even throwing dry flies. I know I really enjoy streamers a lot more than nymphing. Streamers do not match a hatch, but they represent a part of the diet for most larger trout, so it is worth knowing how to fish them. In some spots like really deep pools or even some deeper runs, a streamer is the only way that you are, well, I don't want to say that. It's not the only way, but it is. Uh, one of the most effective ways to lure the really big trout up and out of hiding. So hopefully that answers your question, Al. I really appreciated that question as well. Uh, Let me know if I can clarify or or clear things up for you at all uh, after that. So thanks a bunch for sending that one on in. Okay, our next question comes to us. Clyde from Oregon writes in and says, Thank you so much for all your tips and tricks. I took your advice about not being stuck in a rut, and I tried a double dropper and nailed my biggest trout yet, a 14-inch steelhead. My question is, what am I doing wrong? I took my fiancé out around dusk, and we saw many fish rising and slurping something off of the surface. I looked at the water and tried to identify some bugs that they might be eating, but I could not see any bugs on the surface. So I tied on a caddis emerger in hopes that they would take uh, that they would take that. I whipped out the fly and still no bites. I even saw rises happening right next to my fly. What was I doing wrong? Thank you for your help. Tight lines. Well, Clyde, thank you a ton uh, for the kind words that you had for us. And I'm really stoked that you took the advice that Alex and I gave in episode 39. Uh, that was some uh, seven tips to level up your fly fishing, I believe was the title of that episode. And and one of the one of the pieces of advice was don't get stuck in a rut. Try and force yourself to do new things so that you learn more about fly fishing. And man, that paid off for Clyde. So that's a nice fish. It sounds like you, you did a good job there. In answer to your question, I would not say that you are doing anything quote unquote wrong. Your process is really sound, and you made I I think you made the right call. Where you probably could improve there's three spots probably the right pattern picking the right emerger pattern can be tricky sometimes uh the size and then the presentation so let's dive into those three things kind of kind of tear those apart hopefully give you some give you some information here so when fish eat emergers for those of you who don't know it is very common to see a very splashy rise when fish are eating emergers, they're just kind of coming up and slapping those flies. But the rise form that I see most often is where they rise, but you only see their dorsal and tail fin breaking the surface. That is the key to recognizing that trout are eating a merger instead of a dun, because the uh, the smaller splashy rises can be indicative of small trout coming up to eat as well. So that's not always a telltale sign that they're eating emergers it 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 does work and especially to where Clyde said he didn't see anything else on the surface it must have just been emergers that's what leads me to believe that hey Clyde nailed this process he he looked he matched as best as he could could do what was on the water and and that's what you want to do so again Clyde you nailed the process but 
once you know what they're eating, what do you do next? Well, you tie on an emerger pattern and hope that you get the species right. And Clyde, you may have gone wrong with that emerger pattern. I, I mentioned that. Maybe it was midges or some kind of mayfly coming off this time of year. I'm not super familiar with Oregon's hatches. Uh, I know it's different than what I've got out here in the Rockies, just time-wise and, and when certain things are going to be coming off. Uh, but but I say, you know, midges and mayflies are pretty likely if this is a recent story that you're telling me about because those bugs are hatching a lot right now, especially on my local rivers. But let's say for the sake of the argument that you picked the right emerger pattern, that it was caddis that were coming off. And I'm going to go ahead and guess that you did that because you probably saw some caddis buzzing around. Um, and, and that would be a, just a little detour here. That would be a good thing to do. Clyde said he saw fish splashing up off the top, but there weren't any bugs on the surface. If you're in that situation and you don't know what kind of a merger pattern to tie on, look at what's in the air around you. The bugs might be off the surface of the water where you're standing. You just might not be able to see them. But if there are bugs in the air around you, that can tell you, hey, that's a mayfly or that's a caddis. And that will further inform your fly choice. So that, that's just one, that's one other uh, piece of information you can use to try and and make the best choice possible with your flies. So let, let's get back to, let's assume that Clyde picked the right pattern. Let's say he picked the caddis pattern and it, that, that was perfect. And he is still getting refused. The trout are just ignoring it. They're rising right next to his fly, which is one of the most frustrating things that will ever happen. Oh, oh my goodness. It, the consternation of watching a big fish rise right next to your fly. It's, it's almost as frustrating as when you come home, it's been a really tough day at work and you open the freezer, you're going to have that last drumstick and someone else ate it. Yeah. Yeah. That happens sometimes. (laughs) Well, anyways, well, at, at that point, the fish, could be refusing the cat the emerger pattern because maybe the size is just wrong. It's hard to match emerger sizes because you don't really see the emergers. Uh, a lot of emerger patterns that I see folks fishing are in that 16 to 18 range, which is fairly normal, but you might need to size down to like a 20 or a 22. That's not out of the question. That's not abnormal. I fish flies that size frequently. Uh, not everybody does and not everybody needs to, but uh, I have a lot of emergers that size in my box for this exact uh, for this exact situation. Now, let's say that you've got the right size and you know you've got the right size, but they're still ignoring it. Well, the presentation component of this is critical, all right? You can have the right fly on there, but if your presentation is bad, trout are going to ignore it because they'll be able to spot immediately that that one is fake. You want to make sure that you have absolutely no drag on your murder to try and make it look and feel as realistic as possible. Clyde, the fact that you said you had rises going on right next to your fly tells me that you probably had some sort of presentation issue or fly choice problem likely in that order. That That's how I would go about trying to fix it. Uh, as an example, a couple of weeks ago, Alex and I were up fishing and he whooped my butt on the river and we were driving back to my house and we decided to stop off at this lake. And I was kind of, you know, my pride was hurting a little bit because he'd caught all the fish and he caught this enormous rainbow trout and he's just lording it over me in the truck on the way home. Just every five minutes, he looks over and, hey, Spencer, Remember that big fish I caught today? And I was about ready to throw him out of the truck. No, I'm kidding. That didn't happen. He would have been well within his rights to, though, because I sometimes I give Alex more more uh, grief than I should about the fish that he catches. So he, he would have been well within his rights to, to holler at me for it. But he didn't, thankfully. Anyways, we stop off at this lake, and the fish are just going nuts in the shallows, uh, like 10 feet offshore. So it's a piece of cake fly cast and I get up 
And I toss my fly out there and the fish start refusing it. And they were refusing Alex's too. So it wasn't just me. Uh, I had to start tweaking my fly choice. Uh, and I went with uh, presentation first. So I actually sized my tippet down a little bit before I changed my fly. And it took uh, a few minutes. But once I dialed it in, and I, I think it was a size 18 parachute atoms that I was using. It wasn't anything fancy, but I, I went from 4X down to 5X tippet and knocked my flyer from a 16 down to an 18. Once I did that, it was like a switch flipped and I started catching all the fish and there was a little bit of karma payback from earlier when Alex was whooping my butt. So, uh, you know, I, I still do this, this process that I've described and I've been fishing for more than 20 years now at this point. So it, it is still a process that you will work at and tweak throughout your entire fishing career. So just keep that in mind. It's a good skill to develop because that is what the ability to recognize what the fish are eating and to, to change, to make changes based on the information that you're getting is what will help you take that next step as an angler. Now, I, I kind of glossed over a few answers to your question, Clyde, because I've actually got a really great question. Not that yours wasn't good, Clyde. Yours, yours was wonderful. It was perfect. It was stupendous. It was huge. All right. It was amazing. Um, <laughs> anyways, Clyde, uh, I am going to go in depth on a couple on a topic that's related very closely to your question. So I, I, didn't give as many in-depth answers with yours because I think we're going to help folks learn how to fish emergers better by answering this next question. So stick around, grab your Diet Coke, get ready because this next question is going to be a great one. This next question is one that I could probably do an entire episode around and I probably should <laughs> at some point but we're going to answer it pretty in-depth on today's show. And just as a reminder, if any of you have a topic that you'd like to see answered like in an entire episode, uh, let me know because I would love to be able to do uh, entire episodes on just certain topics. So if you've got something like that, let us know. All right. Javen from Oregon writes in and asks the question, when you talk about small fly sizes, how small should you really go? If you're looking for 16-inch trout, doesn't a size 22 seem too small? Well, this is the answer to the hook uh, for today's episode as well. These are the flies that you need more of in your box because you are going to uh, elevate your fly fishing game by having these in your box. They, you're going to catch more fish by using small flies. And I will explain those things in, in a minute. So, uh just to answer your question right on the face, Javen, uh, size 22 is not too small. Uh, I actually caught a 22-inch trout on a size 26 parachute midge one time. And my buddy Ryan McCullough, who taught me everything I know about fishing small flies, he caught a 21-inch trout on a size 28. Sometimes big fish want small flies. Uh, and, and those... Those are extreme cases. I don't expect everybody to all of a sudden go out and start fishing size 24s because that's just ridiculous. Uh, and I kind of, Ryan and I were trying to see how big of a fish could we catch on the small, that small of a hook. It, it, we had a, we had a, well, I say had, we still have a problem <laughs> with small flies. We love doing it. It's a, it, it's just a type of fishing that I really enjoy. And I'll get more into that actually in story time today. So you'll definitely want to stick around for that. So you'll hear some, you'll hear some fun small fly stories. Uh, the uses for small flies and everything else. I, you know, I wanted to use this question from Javen uh, really as a jumping off point to talk about, to talk all about fly fishing with small flies. Like I said, I love, I love doing it. Um, it's something that I feel fairly confident in. I'm not going to go out and say that I'm an expert or that I'm an amazing at it, but I feel confident that I can, I can do it and catch a reasonable amount of fish. I've had a lot of practice 
It's something, again, I feel confident in this, in this skill of mine. So a lot of what I uh, am going to talk about regarding fishing small flies can and should be applied to fishing emerger patterns. During Clyde's question, the previous one, I mentioned that part of his issue was probably due to some presentation. Well, the small flies, oh, presentation is absolutely critical when you're fishing with small flies because you actually, if you think about it, the fly is so small that you have less to mess up with than you do with larger flies, if that makes sense. Because with a larger fly, you can kind of mess a drift up for a second. It's not going to immediately pull on that big fly. But on the small flies, it, it really, you have almost no room for error. You've got to be really, really solid. So take the lessons that I'm about to share on small flies. Take these to heart for mergers as well. And again, before I dive into this, I just want to make it clear that when we're talking about small flies, I think anything under a 20 probably qualifies as uh, really small for the sake of our discussion. So I'm going to go over uh, two points. I'm going to go over how to rig up small flies because that's uh, something I, I do see folks struggle with and then how to set the hook on these small flies. So let, let's just go ahead and dive right into it. With rigging up small flies, I will often see folks trying to thread like 4X or 5X tippet through the eye of a small fly. In these situations, you are going to want to bust out the 6X tippet. I actually carry 7X and 8X. I own 9X tippet. I don't have that with me all the time because that's just ludicrous. I'm not, I mean, I love small flies, but I'm not crazy, okay? <laughs> All right, and I don't have 10x tippet. Okay, I know folks who have 10x tippet. I even know a guy with some nine and a half. He he can build himself an angel hair leader if he really needed to at some point. Uh, the, the seven seven x and eight x those are extreme use cases. Six x is really solid for anything down to about a twenty four. You might you might need to bump it down to seven x if you're going to go twenty six and twenty eight. But down to a 24, 6X is going to be just fine. What I like to do is I like to have at least two feet of 6X tippet going down to that dry fly. I like the two foot length because it's enough to help reduce micro drag. And micro drag is exactly what it sounds like. It's a really tiny drag that is very difficult to see. Really, it results from the tippet pulling on the fly as it drifts. You sometimes will see this if you are fishing a tippet that is too large to adequately, adequately present the fly. If you've got like 3X and you're trying to fish a 16, it's pretty easy to see the micro drag at that point because you'll see that that thicker tippet should pulling a little bit harder on that fly and it's going to create some micro drag. Uh, like I said, it's very tough to see, but it exists because, like I said, that thick line will actually pull on the small flies because the small flies have very little resistance to that thicker line. It's not a very harmonious drift. It's clunky. It doesn't look as natural, and the fish can spot that from a mile away. I also like using 6X for my small flies because lighter tippets are going to help you present the flies with more delicacy, which creates a more realistic landing of that fly. If you're fishing a really small fly, you want that to just kiss the water. Like my buddy Ryan says, you want it to land like a butterfly with sore feet. So if you're using small enough tippet and you get that delicate enough presentation, the trout are less likely to be spooked by your small fly landing on the water. If you are using that 6X tippet instead of 4X, that 4X is going to make more of a splash than your 6X will. Finally, I also highly, highly recommend using long leaders in situations like this as well if you're fishing small flies. A longer leader can help extend your drift without creating any extra drag. It can help lay down flies even softer, uh, and those longer leaders can help reduce or eliminate that micro drag completely. For small flies, I'm usually talking about a 12-foot leader at a minimum. Uh 
Alex and Berkeley and I were all out in Oregon uh, at the beginning of the summer fishing. And we were fishing this big flat pool and fish were just rising everywhere in this pool. And I ended up having to build like almost a 15 foot leader went all the way down to seven X tippet because the water was so calm and clear and the fish were so picky that my six X tippet wasn't landing softly enough and it was pulling on my flies too much. So I ended up having to size all the way down to that really small stuff because anything bigger than that, the fish wouldn't even look at it. And I knew it was a presentation problem relating to my tippet and uh, my leader size because as soon as I made those changes, I started getting into fish fairly consistently. Berkeley made some similar changes uh, to me. He was fishing right next to me. Alex was Alex was downstream. He was swinging, he was swinging flies like soft tackles through it, and he caught more fish than both of us. I think uh, he was <laughs> he was having a lot of fun. But Berkeley and I wanted the small fly experience, so so we got it. But that's just one example, one real life example of, yes, these tactics work and you do need to, you do need to know how to use them. All right. So we've covered how to rig up your small flies. Let's talk about how to set the hook on these, on these bad boys. My buddy, Ryan McCullough, I uh, mentioned him earlier. He was the reason that I know how to fish small flies. I, everything I learned about small flies, I learned from Ryan. And one of the things that he said to me, uh, when, cause I remember the first time he pulled out one of his size 28s, I looked at him and I said, are you serious? He said, yeah, I'm dead serious. I'm like, how are you going to hook a fish on that? And he looks at me and he says, well, the point of the hook is the same size on a size 24 as it is on a size 14. Now, I don't know if that's strictly true, but it sounds really good. And I like it. I like things that sound really good. Uh, and it also drives home a point that I want to make as well, which is that if your hook set is good, you don't need to worry too much about the hook being too small to land the fish. I've never had a small hook bend out on me, even with the really big fish that I've caught, because I'm using such long tippets and usually soft rods that uh, that hasn't been an issue yet. So knock on wood, hopefully I, I don't have that issue happen. Uh I've, I've broken, I haven't even broken a small hook on big fish. I've broken plenty of tippets, but I haven't broken the hook itself. So Ryan's saying, like I said, I don't know if it's scientifically true, but it sounds really good. So I'm going to, I'm going to go with it. We can do that now, right? If it sounds good, we can go with it. That, it's our thing. <laughs> the hook sets though can be tough to wrangle on small flies because It is really easy to just yank that smaller hook out of the fish's mouth if you start setting that hook too soon. When I'm fishing really small flies, I like to try and watch for the fish to close its mouth and then sink back beneath the water before I gently set the hook. I I can't stress that gently part enough. Uh, And I've actually been victim lately to setting the hook too soft and I've been losing a lot of fish. It's really frustrating. But with these small flies, you do want to set that hook gently. If you just yank on it, that fly is small enough that you might just pull it out. The force of uh, the force of you setting really hard might just pull that fly right out of its mouth. What you want is a firm, solid lift of the fly rod while keeping, you know, there's, there shouldn't be any slack in, in your fly line. And then just keep your line nice and tight against the cork of the rod when you make that firm solid lift it's just a very not a not a snap in the wrist not like you're cracking a whip just a good solid lift so i think that kind of covers it yeah just make sure that you really uh take the time watch the fish eat the fly completely before you set that hook if you if it's too far away and you can't see it but you see the rise uh, a good thing to do is count one one thousand i've even heard some people say uh, Say out loud, God save the queen before, I guess it'd be God save the king now. Uh, God save the king before you set that hook. It's just that pause before you set the hook with these smaller flies, especially if it's a slow eat like that, will help you increase your hook set 
uh, ratio. All right. I think that is about it for small flies. If I didn't dedicate an entire episode to this topic, which I think I'm going to in the future. But if you have any more questions about small flies, if I, if I brought up stuff that was just off the wall, you have no clue what I'm talking about, please let me know so I can clarify those things for you. Uh, I, I do answer emails. So if you if you email in a question about something like this, I'm happy to email back and forth with you and hopefully clear some things up. Uh, but thanks, Javen, for sending that question on in. I really appreciate it. And let's go ahead and move on to the next one. So this is the last question of the show this week. But remember, we have story time coming up after this. So stick around. You do not want to miss story time. It's my favorite part of the show. No, the whole show is my favorite. I don't have a favorite. That'd be like asking me to pick a favorite child. You know, it's just impossible, right? (laughs) Oh, well, this question comes to us from Parker in Colorado. Parker writes in and says, hey, Spencer, love the podcast. I started fly fishing two months ago. My only fishing buddy has less experience than I do. What's a good method to fish with another angler? I want to wade nearby to see each other's catches, but don't want to crowd the water. Should we take opposite sides of the river? Any advice would be great. Well, Parker, thank you for the note. And this is a this is an interesting question. I think a lot of folks are going to have different opinions. So I'm just going to go out here. And, uh, I'm going to I'm going to give you my answer to it. And remember, this ain't gospel truth. This I'm not telling you you have to do it my way. And if you think my way is dumb, then okay. But th- this is. This is how I do it, and uh, it's worked well for me over the years, and so it might work well for uh, other folks as well. Uh, I'll give you a couple examples. Uh, A few weeks ago, Alex and I were out fishing together. We were filming some really cool stuff that's coming up soon, actually, so stay tuned to YouTube because we've got awesome stuff on the way. But we uh, we were fishing together. We were on a pretty small river. I mean, it was... I don't know, 20 feet ish wide, uh, pretty consistent width. But I, I just kind of took the left side and Alex took the right and we just fished, uh, up the river together. We didn't get too far ahead of each other cause we didn't want to spook fish, but I would just fish the stuff on the left and he would fish the stuff on the right. And sometimes we'd come to holes that it was like a one guy hole. So we'd, you know, we'd just swap off and, and that's how we would we fish that river together. It, it was big enough that you could do that. Uh, sometimes we will fish rivers. Alex and Berkeley and I did this in February this year. Actually, it was three of us together, and we walked down this trail and got in the river, and we just all started taking turns at the hole. So I think like Alex started, and then Berkeley went, then I went, and we just go up the river, just taking turns on each hole, doing it that way. Uh, you know, when you when you want to spend time with the folks that you're out there fishing with, that, that's a good way to do it. If you're on bigger water, like the lower Provo in Utah, for example, I'll throw that one out there, or something like the frying pan in Colorado below the dam or the green in Utah, you can be like 50-ish yards away from your buddy and not be too close. You could probably even be close in that. You could probably like 20 yards, 10 yards from them. You don't need to be super far away because uh, the rivers that get a lot of pressure or that see a lot of anglers, they tend to be better for fishing next to your buddies because the fish are a lot more forgiving of folks being in the river. And really, you just want to make sure that you're not standing where they're going to try and drift with their flies because then that creates an obvious problem. But, you know, close enough that you can see what they're catching and, and tell them, oh, good job. So uh, th- that's how I'd recommend fishing kind of those those bigger rivers. Uh, kind of by their nature, it is tough to do something like that on smaller streams because you usually don't have enough room to fish at the same time. You also run into that problem of folks walking ahead of each other and potentially spooking fish. So that's why I'm a big fan of either leapfrogging each other or just going up and, all right, Alex, it's your turn to fish. Okay, Alex, you caught a fish. Now it's my turn. I think that's how Alex and I do it most of the time. If we're on water, that it's just tough to to get to. Well, there, there's only enough room for one guy to fish it. It's 
I fish, I catch a fish, and then as soon as I catch a fish, it's Alex's turn, and he goes until he catches a fish. And that, that's been a pretty good way, I think, for the two of us. We've fallen into a pretty good routine uh, that, that's worked well for us there. So that's how I do it. But if any of y'all fish together differently, different ways that work, uh, let me know. I'd love to hear about them. And with that, folks, this is not the end of the show. Remember, we've got story time coming up next. So make sure you're comfortable. Grab something to eat. Grab a drink and settle in because it is story time. Before I start the story this week, I do need to give a shout out to Berkeley, one of the other team members here at VFC. He does tons of wonderful things, but I want to shout out, uh, he's been working on a pretty big project for the last couple of months, uh, tying flies and trying to improve our, our fly quality. And he's been doing, actually, sorry, I'm going to pick that again. Sorry. Before I start story time this week, I want to give a little shout out to Berkeley, one of the other team members here at VFC. Uh, Berkeley does tons of really awesome stuff, but I just saw today a picture of one of the flies that he just tied, and Berkeley's actually been working on a fly tying related project uh, for us here, and he has, in the course of that, he has been tying and tying and tying flies like a madman. The guy has just gone nuts. And I saw a picture of a parachute Adams that he did. And this thing looks incredible. I I've like best parachute Adams I've ever seen. It was really, really good. And I, I was really impressed too, because Berkeley has been, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I, I don't think he's been tying flies for more than maybe a couple of years at the most. So and I've been tying flies for, oh, better part of a decade I've been tying. So Berkeley has gone in like the last few months to way better than I will ever be. So it's just a, a reiteration of the the stuff we preach at Ventures, which is practice and hard work is going to get you places. That's exactly what Berkeley's done. There's no shortcut to it. He's just been doing it and doing it and getting it down to the point now where his flies, like I said, that parachute Adams looks better than any parachute Adams I've ever tied. So he's done a really, really phenomenal job with it. Just wanted to shout him out. Uh, but story time this week actually involves me and Alex and Berkeley. So the three of us, we were in Oregon to start the summer. I mentioned this earlier and I know I said earlier in the show too, I was going to tell a story about small flies so this does involve small flies. But we drove out. It was, I think it was very into May. We were out in Oregon, and we drove out of this river. Alex and Berkeley had never been there before. I've fished it a lot, and I, I was really excited to show it to them. It's one of my top three rivers, I think. So we were out there together, and we get to the river, and it just... It was it was like the dam burst, the rain that was coming down, and then it turned into hail. And I've never seen a storm like that out there. This was this was an East Coast thunderstorm in the middle of the Oregon desert. So that was really interesting <laughs> because I lived on the East Coast for a little bit, and those those rainstorms out there are just so it's a different beast than what we have out here in the Rockies. So just so much more water that falls than what we get out here in our storms. Well, the storm kind of tapered off, and we were driving up along the river, and we, we stopped to look at the river for a second, and luckily the river wasn't muddy. Even with that much rain that had just come down, it wasn't muddy. So we stopped, we'll get out, and it was still drizzly a little bit. Like I said, the rain had tapered off. It hadn't stopped. And being the wonderfully intelligent people that we are, None of us brought rain gear because, oh, well, it's Oregon in the summer and we're going to the desert. We don't need rain gear. Da-da. Well, Alex and I get out. We look at the river and there are fish rising and there are blue wings hatching like nuts. So we go back to the truck, realize that we don't have any of our rain gear. 
and say, hey, you know what, heck with it, we're going to go fish anyways. Berkeley didn't want to get wet, so he ended up sitting in the truck for a little bit until the rain petered off completely, and then he came down. But that that hatch, like I said, there were blue wings coming off. That hatch was the most incredible hatch I think I've ever fished. If not the most incredible, it's in the top three. It was insane. The fish were just going after it felt like they were eating every dry off the top of the water and there's tons of fish in this river so they were uh, there were plenty of fish to go around to eat all those bugs they it was like the river was boiling every cliche that you hear about a good hatch we actually experienced it and like i said eventually berkeley comes down after the rain peters off even more and we're lined up it was berkeley then alex or no it was alex then berkeley then me And we could not have been more than 150 feet apart, all three of us. And we caught so many fish in the span of that hatch. It was maybe two hours. It wasn't a terribly long hatch. And it was really interesting, though, because as the hatch progressed, we were there right at the beginning. So we were there as they were eating emergers, and then they turned on to duns. And it was a real sudden switch. It was like a switch was flipped, honestly. They... They were eating, eating, eating the emergers, and then I saw a fish rise and put my emerger over him. Nothing. Did it again? Nothing. So I'm scratching my head. I'm like, what? And then I see some bigger duns on the surface, and I watch one of them get eaten. So I switched immediately over to the dun and did really, really well for a little bit, and then it changed again because they were looking for the spent wings at that point, the spinners. So... It was really cool to watch the entire hatch progress completely and fish along with the progressions. That was a really fun experience to have, and it reiterated a couple of things. First, always bring your rain gear, even if you don't think you're going to need it. And second, make sure that you are paying attention as the hatch wears on and changing your flies accordingly so that you don't get left sitting there not catching any fish that wouldn't have been any fun but uh well that that's it folks that wraps up the show today i hope y'all enjoyed it thanks as always for taking the time to listen to the show please rate and review this show subscribe to it wherever you're listening to the show share it with your friends your neighbors even your enemies because i mean you know you want them to be happy too right maybe maybe a little bit yeah, share it with them anyways. <laughs> uh, and as always, if you got questions about fly fishing and you want them answered, send them on in, and I will do my best to try and help you out. And until next week, everybody, get out on the water, take advantage of the great fall weather that we've got left, and tight lines.